I haven't found the schedule. Oh, so I guess I didn't know it because I have the schedule right here. <coughs> yes. This? Wednesday, 10 15. We'll probably have our choice of whatever room you prefer. Hmm. Unless somebody else is on there at the same time. Is that the 23rd? I think so. Whatever Wednesday is. What about Wednesday at 11? Is that better? Friction involved, are you rolling now? Okay, good point. Uh, friction involved in, uh, in using belts and pulleys and the like. With chains, of course, that's no problem. Chains don't tend to slip, and so they're considered to be infinitely friction, frictional. But belts, belts can have a little bit of slippage. Uh, the, the, the model is that given a load that needs to be held, and we'll uh, call that, I think we'll call that T2 through here for the most part, you want the belt to decrease the amount of load required for each time it wraps around. And it might not wrap around a lot, but it might wrap around several times, such that then on the other end, very little force is required. And it's a great way to, uh, to tie up your horse when you mosey into the saloon, of course. But it's also the way a pulley works, uh, a belt works when it's just going over a pulley, that there's a lot more load on one side than the other. And in fact, uh, for all the times we've ever used pulleys before, if you remember through physics one and the like, um, and a lot of it we will do in dynamics until later in the term, we always said the tension was the same all the way through, that the pulley was massless, so it took no extra force to accelerate it up to speed, and also frictionless, and that it didn't take any force to just keep it turning. But the reality is, if that were the case, if the tension was the same on both sides, there'd, no, there'd be no unbalanced moment and the pulley wouldn't actually turn. So there's got to be some kind of imbalance between these two, uh, just for general pulley use for the pulley to turn, uh, even accelerate up to speed, if, and only if we allow things to accelerate in this class, which we don't. So we'll look at this picture. We'll uh, take a little bit of a uh, edge of a pulley there, some kind, with a belt running over it. As you can imagine, the amount of pulley in contact with the belt is going to have a significant portion of the result in terms of the difference between T1 and T2. And for certain instances you want that minimized, that difference between those two, in certain instances you want that maximized. So a couple things then we got here, we'll put, uh, we'll put T2 up in that end and T1 down here. The contact angle is from the point where it just loses contact from one side to the other. We'll call that beta because that's a fun letter to write. And to set up our analysis, we'll look at a little tiny incremental strip of this belt that is an angle alpha away from the start and is itself an angle of del alpha. So that'll be our, our uh, theoretical construct so we can figure out based upon how many times or how much of the belt 
and the pulley are in contact, what then is the difference between T1 and T2? What can we expect to be the advantage uh, of that kind of setup if that's what we need? Okay with the picture? And then, of course, some um, coefficient of friction at the interface of mu s, whatever that might be. Remember the point might be to minimize the friction between the belt and the pulley for whatever reason, or to maximize it. We'll take that little picture and bring it over here. Greatly blowed up. do our usual, do a force balance on it, do a, a moment balance if we need to, to so we can see, uh, to see the deal that we've got going. So that's got enough of a curve to it that T1 and T2 have a little bit of an angle to them. I'll exaggerate it here. Uh, so that'll be T2 plus delta t, because we're a little bit, sorry, not t2, t, we'll just call it t, because we're just someplace along. t plus delta t, because that's a little bit extra of the force that can be held from what's over there, just t, because of that elemental uh, bit of wrapping around the, the pulley. That makes these angles del alpha over 2. So those are the two forces in the belt. Because of the friction along the belt, there's a little bit of additional force that can be held uh, back on the back side. We'll call the normal force that's contacting there, delta N, making this frictional component, mu S, delta N. And so that would be our, our uh, free body diagram of that little tiny segment that we've taken out of the belt to analyze. And then of course what we're going to do is integrate along the entire contact angle beta. Everybody okay and and pictorially caught up? Yes, sir. All right. So we need to sum the forces. Um, well, that, that's a, a little bit problematic. And then what? In that we not don't necessarily have an x y direction. So what we'll do is set up our own coordinate system. We'll call that the tangential direction and that the normal direction. In the same direction as the, uh, the normal force itself, which makes it perpendicular to the, the curve that that is all making. We'll actually use that coordinate system uh, to good advantage when we get to dynamics of the spring. Okay, so that's that's our parts so there there so far. So let's see. Just do a force balance. We have T cosine del alpha over two. That's the tangential. Oh, sorry, the tangential direction. That's the tangential component down here. Plus in the same direction, U S delta n. The normal force is perpendicular to that direction, so it doesn't contribute. Then we have T plus delta T cosine del alpha over 2 on the other side. So the, the uh, plus tangential direction forces equal the minus tangential direction forces. Yeah? 
Everybody okay? Cody okay back there with that? Okay. And we can simplify a little bit. Uh, we have T cosine over here. We have T cosine over here. So those two are going to cancel. And then we can solve for just the frictional component. Uh, well, we're not necessarily solving for it. It's that if we take the T cosine part over and then it cancels, it'll leave us only that over here. And we get delta T cosine del alpha over 2. Doesn't help us a lot because we're talking about these small little sections here. But of course, we're going to do the usual calculus thing with that and uh, do this in the limits. So do the same, same thing in the normal directions. So that would be uh, T sine delta alpha over 2 and a T plus delta T sine alpha over here. So that's going to be combined to be 2T plus delta T sine del alpha over 2. Just a, a little bit of algebra on the fly there. Equals just delta n. What's next, do you think? What would you do if this were your problem? Sit quietly until I did it for you. Well, delta n, we have no interest in that. We do have an interest in delta t, because that's going to tell us what's the difference between the forces on the two sides of this, the whole, uh, at least part of the point of using the pulley. So let's eliminate delta n from those equations. Pretty easy. Take the second one, stick it into the first one. Do a little bit of solving around, that's what we call it, and we get then cosine del alpha over 2 minus mu s sine del alpha over 2. Delta T Delta Alpha and that equals, let's see, I don't think I need this picture anymore, so I'll keep the equation contiguous. That equals then uh, on the other side mu s t sine del alpha over 2 over del alpha over 2. Let me double check that and make sure I didn't make any goofs. Cosine mu s sine. Okay. turn we have in there doesn't do any damage. So I'm just going to real quickly rewrite this as we then take it apart. So if you have room, just write the limit in front of it. 
you don't have room, rewrite the whole thing, won't kill you. I'll put the whole thing. We're going to take the limit on both sides. So, uh, in violation of mathematical protocol, I'm going to leave the equal sign inside the limit. Okay, got the picture there? We're just taking the limit as delta t goes to 2 of the whole piece up there. As delta alpha goes to 0, what happens to the cosine? That goes to 1. How about the sign? Yeah. Goes to zero. So that piece disappears completely. As delta F alpha goes to zero, this becomes dt over d alpha, the differential. So we'll be okay with that. that. And sine delta t again here goes to zero. So we're left with dt d alpha equals, that's, that's this piece right here, this whole piece is just one, so we don't even have to do any math, this is just too impossibly easy for us, equals mu s t. Beautiful, I love a simple result. while I was a kid. That was simple. Okay? So that's what we need. That's in terms of alpha. I'll leave that picture up there. We're not quite done with it, I guess. Yeah, we probably are. Because now we can solve that. So I have, I'm just rewriting it. We have D, T, D alpha equals mu s t and we can then integrate that from t1 to t2 which is what we're looking for. We want to see what the difference is between those two depending upon uh, how much around the, uh, the wrap we go. Oh, I'm sorry, wait a second. I'm missing something. Oh, I'm missing a step in here, so sorry. I'm missing a small step in here. Uh, we need to collect variables. So this becomes dt over t equals mu s d alpha. Sorry about that. That's what we'll then integrate. Then you're taking notes and pencils. Mm -hmm. it's, I think the first mistake all term by me at the board, right? Of course. So we'll integrate that from T1 to C2. Integrate that from uh, 0 over the whole angle beta. Who's our uh, integration monster in here wants to do that? Ah, Cody's got his hand up. He'll do it. Oops. Yeah, I never remember either. Integrates to T2 equals T1 times E to the mu s beta, which is pretty darn simple. Remember, beta is the entire contact angle in radians. How much of the belt 
is actually in contact with the pulleys or with the cylindrical surface or whatever it is. Actually, you notice the whole thing here had nothing to do with the pulley actually turning. And that contact angle can, of course, be several times around. And that just all accumulates to the contact angle. So now we're ready to tie up our horse and go on in the uh, saloon and we'll appreciate that uh, we can relax, enjoy our sarsaparilla, and the horse will be there when we come out because we shoot horse thieves. Still okay. a law in Texas. What? Still a law in Texas. Should be. Should be a law everywhere. So here's, here's a hitch and post, which of course is just a log. Man, that looks, that looks like a log. That's a pretty accurate picture. And the question is simply, to hold that Appaloosa filly I so love, how many times must I wrap it around such that the weight of the rain hanging down is enough to hold uh, whatever the horse might apply as a, a, an opposing I Two times forward, get away. one around, and then what? one back. What? Two times around, one around the, the the loop, and then one back. No. That's pretty standard for tying up a horse. Yeah, it is. <laughs> but that's because a, an awful lot of cowboys, and you may not know this little piece of history. I do, because I'm from the West. awful lot of cowboys never actually took an engineering science course <laughs> at a community college. Really? An awful lot of them didn't. And so they don't know that... Just wrap it around and let it hang if you do it enough times. <laughs> so, assuming old paint can pull with 800 newtons, and assuming there's two newtons hanging off there, how many times do I need to wrap it around to get that to be secure enough? Simple as that. So, that becomes then T2. This becomes T1. We'll need a coefficient of friction between the two. Everybody knows the coefficient of friction between the leather hand rubbed and a debarked pole is 0.6. So you guys can come up with then. What if it's burnished? Which one, the rain or the... The, the leather. The leather? It's it hand rubbed. Have, Why would you burnish it after hand rubbing it? To make it shinier. It have less mew. No. Look, you can, <laughs> shine, you can shine your boots or you can shine your reins. You always shine your boots. See? He, he knows that now. Now that that truth comes out, he's fully aware of it, and he's very embarrassed of what he said about burnishing the rain. All right, so solve for beta. Very simple, very straightforward, I hope. Which means I'm not going to do it. You do it, Tex. <coughs> you do it, Brett. Bell, you do it. Sarah, you do it. Um, Doc. What else? What else? What else? Rusty. Oh, Cody. Cody, we'll just leave that alone. <laughs> <laughs> Might shorten it to Wild Bill. All right, so this is nothing more now than a math exercise for you to uh, see if you can remember what the heck to do with the exponents or with the exponential.
exponential function. I know a wild bill. You know a wild bill? Yeah, we watched them on YouTube last, last semester. You need that. You did what? We watched them on YouTube um, in class last semester. Oh, we, we did. did. Oh, wow. In uh, Intro to Engineering. We did? Got tased on the Hudson. Oh, <laughs> oh I, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, wild. yeah, that was Wild Bill, wasn't it? Yeah. All right, so you got to figure out how to undo the exponential function. Oh, man, that's like uh, math stuff. So we have T2 over T1 equals E to the 0.6 beta. We're looking for beta. Remember, that's in radians, so that's going to tell us how many times this, uh, this sometimes screwed up the cowboys. They weren't sure what a radian, they couldn't remember what a radian was. That'll secure the horse, do you think? Did you check with the uh, bell? Sarah, did you check with Bell? <coughs> you guys okay? You agree? Remember how to do it there? So if we take the natural log of both sides, that undoes the exponential function and then you can solve for it. John, got it? John? I got, I got a wrong answer. Okay. Your calculator actually tells you that. Or yeah. you just assume it's true. If there's a number on the calculator, there's it's wrong. A, There's just a guy laughing at me thinking, <laughs> you know math. You got a teacher there? You guys you get something? Oh, we were talking about something else. Were we? Yeah. We, were, we were talking about that. Well, he was talking about it. When you integrate it. Yeah? You get L and T, and then it would be from T1 to T2, so it would be T2 L T1. It would be L and T2 minus L and T1. When you bring it over the other side, it's going to be that alpha mu minus T1, not it minus L and what? T1. What? You lost me at the bakery. times T to the mu beta. It's E mu beta ma plus T1. What? Integrate. So that integration is not right? I don't feel that it is. I think it is. I think 100 wraps is way too many to add. <laughs> I mean, the horse will not go anywhere with 100 wraps. That's right. <laughs> but it feels like too many wraps. That's right. Is it really too many? It wraps? does. That's your, it, I mean, that's your prized possession. It should come out to be about, okay. about 10, but not 10 wraps. That's 10 radians. So that's what about uh, about a little over one and a half wraps. Okay. But from the way it has to hunt, hang that'd be one. Well, would one and a quarter be adequate? Would one and a quarter be all right? Yeah, it's kind of cutting it close. And I think this comes out to be one point three wraps. Wraps around. That's the minimum to maintain that. Just letting it go once around and dropping is one and a quarter, so you're cutting it kind of close. So you might have to go to two and a quarter. Can I be shown how you got the 10 radians? Yeah, T2. So this is 800 over 2. Right. 
and that's whatever that is in on the calculator. Seven point six divided by 